Hey everybody, we'll be starting in a little over two minutes. This is a mic check. Hey If you can see the feed and hear me, feel free to type something in the chat. Hey everybody, welcome to number five in the Goldendale Observations series. Uh, five rhymes with live, and that's nice because we're coming to you live, or at least I hope we are, from the glorious new, and I have to say now award-winning, Goldendale Observatory State Park. We uh, recently won an architectural design award. I'm not going to talk about that right now, but I can actually say I say award-winning with a straight face. That's nice. Um, one of the cool things about Goldendale Observatory is that this is not just a museum. This is also not a research facility. This is an educational facility. We do these live shows so that you can learn a few things. Tonight, we're going to be talking about Earth's moon. I have to be specific like that because there are lots of moons. There's over 150 in our solar system alone. But the Earth's moon is quite popular. Uh, because people have known about it since there have been people. It's kind of an obvious object, and it's very easy to study. And as a result, it, it's one of the best studied space objects because studying it is so convenient. But people don't realize we've learned a lot more, a lot of new things about the moon in only recent years, the last few decades. In fact, there was some big news about the moon that broke last month from NASA. We'll be talking about that during this show. Uh, but that being said, even though we are going to be talking about Earth's moon, feel free to ask questions that are about other moons or about other topics in space science. Um, we're going to have fun. We encourage uh, interactivity. This is, uh, this is one of the things that sets us apart. So uh, during this presentation, you can listen to me, but I encourage you also to type back. Uh, the YouTube Live platform, which we're quite happy with, has a very low latency, so I should be able to answer within only a few seconds, assuming I see the question. All right, so where to begin? I'm actually going to do an experiment. This is still kind of a new thing, and this is all kind of an experiment. We're all kind of guinea pigs here. So I could start in a lot of different ways on a lot of different topics regarding Earth's moon. 
But uh, I'm going to let you ask a question first. So let's start with a question. I don't care what it is as long as it's vaguely, vaguely related to what we're talking about. And while you do that, I'm going to put up an interesting video. Oh, interesting question. So that's actually not unrelated. Uh, someone asked about the Arecibo Radio Observatory. Uh, you may have heard the sad news about Arecibo. It recently was damaged. Uh, it sustained some hurricane damage, and then recently one of its main cables snapped, which supports the main feed horn. This is a giant radio telescope in, in uh, Puerto Rico. And unfortunately, the damage is such that they're afraid it's going to be dangerous to fix. And uh, this is, uh, it's, it's sad, but it's, it's, it's been there for over half a century, and it has a very impressive history. Um, it's made a lot of important discoveries. It sent a signal to the M13 star cluster, uh, written partially by Carl Sagan. That's an interesting story. Uh, whether or not any aliens will overhear it, that's another thing. But um, Arecibo was featured in the James Bond film Goldeneye. It was supposedly some kind of a telecommunication station for a Russian uh, electromagnetic pulse satellite weapon or something, but that's not actually what it's used for, I promise. It, it was, past tense, a radio telescope. The reason I'm actually taking some time to answer this question about Arecibo is because the moon may offer a solution. You see, radio telescopes are placed in locations which are radio quiet. You do this, of course, so they don't receive interference. It means that you don't have to filter out as much junk data. Well, you know what would be a great place for a radio telescope? the most radio quiet location in our entire solar system. And that happens to be on Earth's moon, specifically on the far side of the moon. The moon is actually acting like a great shield blocking radio noise from the planet Earth. And so someday we may well install a radio telescope on the far side of the moon in that radio quiet zone. I think that's an interesting thing. So, hey, I'm glad that came up. All right. All right, someone asked how far away the moon is. Now, before I answer that and a bunch of these other really good questions, I want to I wanna confess something. This video you're seeing right here should be live video from our big telescope. However, it is cloudy now. It has clouded up, and it was raining a little bit, and now it's snowing. Well, supposedly snowing. I didn't see it, but my weather device says it's snowing. But there is some precipitation, so I have to close the dome. So this is a recording I made earlier of the moon. Uh, this is a video. It's not an image. If you look carefully, you might notice that it wiggles. Let me uh, demonstrate that. Zoom in a little bit here. Notice how the image seems to go in and out of focus. Notice how the image seems to be unstable. That is good old Earth's atmosphere. Not our friend when it comes to observations of space objects, but that's atmospheric scintillation. That's what causes stars to twinkle. The more air you're looking through, the worse the effect. So yeah, I'm going to leave that up for a second. Okay, someone asked, how far away is the moon? That's a, that's a good starting question. So you could drive there. Let me show you what I mean. It's only 240,000 miles away. Some of you might have a car with an odometer reading that is higher than that number. Uh, I used to have an old Volvo with over 300,000 miles on it. So I could have driven to the moon and part of the way back and got stranded in space. This is all assuming, of course, you find a car that can achieve traction in, in a vacuum and uh, provide unlimited food, water, air, radiation shielding, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But indeed, you could drive to the moon in terms of human lifespan because it is so close. It, is, it's, it goes without saying, this is the closest natural body to our Earth. Now, I start with... Uh, I started last week these shows on YouTube with satellites because the man-made satellites are the closest things to us in space, period. But Earth's moon is the closest natural object. That being said, sometimes for, for brief moments, other objects are closer. You may have heard a few weeks ago we had a near miss from a small asteroid. It was actually discovered after it had already skimmed off the atmosphere. So, uh, yeah, sometimes things do come closer. But as far as regularly in our vicinity, Earth's moon takes the cake. It is very close. So let's have some fun here. We're going we're gonna to bring out the important Windows calculator here. And we're going to type in some numbers. Let's type in 238,855 miles. We're going to divide that by a very legal speed of 70 miles per hour. It'll take you 3,412 hours. That seems pretty low. Divide that by 24 for days. Look at that. You can get to the moon 
in only 142 days of nonstop driving at 70 miles per hour. So a very short trip in the cosmic sense. That, that being said, uh, an, uh, automobiles are not suitable spacecraft because even if they could do all those magical things I mentioned earlier, they're still very, very slow. And that, that is, that's a long trip even for a lunar excursion. Um, you may recall that the Apollo astronauts reached the moon in under four days when they were going, when they were visiting. But of course, they weren't driving in cars. They were being propelled by some of the most powerful rockets ever made. So yeah. Okay, so the distance there, you might notice accommodates 30 Earths so 30 Earths between us and the itty-bitty moon there. Speaking of itty-bitty, the moon is about one quarter the size of the Earth. It's about 2,000 miles across. Uh, exact number I wrote down, it's 2,151 miles across, 59, 2,159 miles across, which is about the width of China. So if you ever looked at China on a map, you can kind of visualize the overall diameter of Earth's moon. Now that... That may seem small because we're so used to space objects that are gargantuan, you know, they're so enormously huge. But um, for a moon, Earth's moon is actually pretty big. So, um, in fact, it's the fifth biggest moon in our solar system. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. Hold that thought. Here's an image of the moon when it's full. I'm going to move that off the screen really quick. Now... This image depicts all of the noteworthy moons in our solar system, a few comets and asteroids for scale's sake, and a few other random bodies. Uh, all, everything on this drawing is provided at scale, which is quite illuminating. As I was saying, Earth's moon, as a moon, is pretty big. It's only smaller than, and I'm going to go in order from biggest to smallest. Ganymede is the largest moon in our solar system. Titan is second. Now, I should tell you who they belong to. This is one of Jupiter's moons, Ganymede. Titan is one of Saturn's moons. Then Callisto, also Jupiter's moon. Io, the famous volcanic moon. And then Earth's moon. So we're number five. Now, that's pretty impressive when you consider the fact that, as I said earlier, Earth's moon is about one-fourth the size of our planet. Because that's an unusual ratio. Io, which is very similar in size to Earth's moon, is one fortieth the size of Jupiter, which is actually a much more ordinary ratio for a planet-moon system. So our moon is actually pretty big compared to the body it orbits. And that does pose a few mysteries that have only recently been adequately addressed, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about tonight. You see, the moon's always baffled uh, astronomers and scientists because there's certain things about it that don't make sense. We used to think that we captured the moon. That is to say that it didn't form around us, but that, that Earth captured it. The problem is it's, it's too massive for that to have happened, especially with the nature of its orbit. But we didn't think it formed with us either because its orbital inclination disagrees with that of our planet. So the moon's orbit, orbital plane, is five degrees off from the ecliptic plane, which is essentially the imaginary plane created when one projects Earth's orbit into the universe. And the moon is way off, way, way off Earth's equatorial plane. So the moon certainly does not orbit Earth's equator. And uh, it much more strongly agrees with the plane of the solar system. And this is why it used to be thought a, a captured object, even though that didn't add up. We're going to talk more about that mystery during this, this uh, video, during this uh, presentation, but keep that in mind. So, anyway, I'm going to look back at my question box here. We've got all kinds of stuff to talk about. And we all have, we have some time, too. Um, because of the uh, clouds and snow and rain, I may not get to spend much time showing you live footage as, as opposed to this recording. But uh, if we do, we'll spend time on that. Normally, these shows go an hour, but it could well go shorter than that. Uh, I don't expect it to go longer tonight because of the weather. Whoa, what a shame. All right, so questions. Oh, that's good. How old is the moon estimated to be? So the moon is about 4.5 billion years old, slightly younger than the entire solar system, which could be around 4.6 or 6.5, um, slightly younger than the Earth, too. Um, and we measure this via multiple uh, mechanisms, including actually checking uh, the isotopic configuration of rare elements inside of the moon rock that was brought back by the astronauts. And by the way, that also led to mystery because 
while they were studying the moon rock, they discovered isotopes that were identical to those found on Earth. So, oh, open and shut. The moon and the Earth must be of the same material, except that they weren't exactly identical. Hmm, strange, another mystery. Hold that thought. Um, the moon is essentially as old as our solar system, but slightly, slightly younger. I should add, though, the moon has not always looked the way that it does, and the moon has certainly not always been as far away. Remember how I said it was close earlier? Well, it used to be a lot closer than that. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. What is the deepest crater on the moon? Ooh, I have a good graphic for that. So let me jump ahead a bit. I'm going to show you a cool uh, image from the... Uh, LRO. Now, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter is a very important satellite that was uh, launched in 2009. It's not an Earth satellite. The Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter orbits the moon at very low altitude. It goes as low as 12 miles or as high as about 150 miles. Its average altitude is closer to 30 miles. And it's such a great proximity, it can image this, the moon with enormous detail. Uh, now, this image you're seeing here is a, a visible wavelength image, optical wavelengths, taken by its wide wide field camera you could zoom in here and you could see lots of wonderful detail however this doesn't tell me the altitude i can i can guesstimate some of these heights based on the relief based on the uh the shadows being cast but i can't tell for sure so let's actually make it for sure this is uh an image provided by the same uh, oh, by the way, I should, should I show you a picture of it. This is the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. This is a drawing, of course. And one of its instruments is actually a, a laser rangefinder. And that instrument was used to take this picture. This, these are images of the poles of the moon, north and south. Now let's compare that laser rangefinder image to an optical wavelength image. What you'll notice is there's less detail here. Notice there's information missing. It's dark here and here. That's because it's literally dark. It's dark there because the moon's tilt is so minor, only about one and a half degrees, that there are areas on its surface that receive almost permanent shade. And these areas, as a result, can be very cold. And as a result, also, as you can see, very dark. And they're difficult to study without actually sending pulses of some form of energy, like radar, or in this case, laser light, into these canyons and crevices. So again, though, I haven't told you the answer to your question yet. These, not, these are not numbers, but I wanted to show you this concept up close. Notice how much more detail we can see in the laser light versus the natural sunlight. So let me bring up that graphic I was telling you about. So let me go back to that one and see. There's the visible light or optical wavelengths, and then here's the, the laser rangefinder. Now, we got a nice little chart up here on the top, a little graph. One of the most astonishing things about the moon is how varied its elevations are. So we have negative 9,000 meters. Multiply that by three roughly to get your feet, roughly. And then we also have positive 10,780 meters. Now the color code here is a little strange. The blues or the, or the violets or purples are lowest elevation, and the whites are kind of the middle and then the highest heights are blacks or browns. As you can see, there's a reason we call these regions the highlands, the lunar highlands, because they are higher, especially over here. This is actually the highest point on the moon over here. Interestingly, right below it is the lowest point on the moon. We're going to talk about why that is in a few minutes. You might be able to make out the man on the moon's face here. This is actually an, an entire projection of the moon surface, the lunar surface. And it's quite neat because we're not only seeing the side that faces us, which is about what I'm drawing a circle of right here. We also see the sides that wrap around on the other. This is the far side, and so is this over here. So there's an extremely low, low spot on the far side. Some of the maria, we're going to talk about that word, are also quite low on our side. And then we see highlands. And also notice some of the crater rims are black. So that would indicate that they're up there in the, in the range of 9,000 meters. That's quite impressive. Questions about that? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. These are all good. 
Oh, it's not. Well, that's a wonderful question. Hey, you guys, this is going to be a good show. We got a lot of good questions here. So let me continue this thought. Um, someone asked about temperatures. I just told you a little bit about elevations. We'll be saying more about that. Let's check this out. All right, there I am again. So this is a, an interesting image, also from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, the LRO. And the coloration here is not, or rather the luminosity, the brightness, the whiteness and the black, is not just random brightness caused by sunlight. In fact, this is infrared data. This is, this is heat data. This is thermal information. And what we see is that in this single image of the, the moon's south pole, we have a tremendous range of temperatures as low as 50 degrees Kelvin, and I'll convert that for you in a second, up to 300 degrees Kelvin. Also, you'll notice that we have some albedo targets. This is a good word to learn if you don't know. In astronomy specifically, we often use the word albedo to refer to reflectivity. Notice that there are some reflective features in some of these craters. We're going to talk about what those are in a second. But first, let's do those uh, temperature calculations for you. So the 50, 50 degrees to Kelvin is about negative 370 degrees Fahrenheit, which is amazingly cold. And then the 300 is about 80 degrees Fahrenheit, which is actually kind of pleasant. So you could, you could survive 80, 80 degrees Fahrenheit, of course. Many of you do it every summer. Um, but you probably would have some trouble thriving in negative 370 degrees Fahrenheit temperatures. Now, that 50 is not actually the bottom of the chart. You can't quite see it because there's a little bit of blackness after the 50. But there are even lower temperatures measured on the moon. Interestingly, even though the South Pole is consistently the most shadowed on the moon, there are certain very deep craters on the North Pole which have been measured even colder. So the, the actual one of the coldest temperatures ever measured in our entire solar system was negative 413 degrees Fahrenheit. So that is not much warmer than absolute zero. I mean, it is warmer than absolute zero, but not enormously so. Speaking of which, if you don't know what I'm talking about here, Here's your absolute zero, which is an astonishing negative 459 degrees compared to that that balmy 400 and what did I say uh, uh, 413 degrees. Wow. Uh, notice we have temperatures on the moon that would exceed the freezing point of water, and of course, but also the melting point of water. Uh, that's, that's a pretty serious temperature swing, and that's very dangerous for equipment and, of course, people. This is one of the reasons that the moon is so challenging. We'll talk about this a bit more, but be aware that part of the reason the moon has such extreme temperature swings is because it is without atmosphere. There's nothing to moderate the temperature change. Once the sun sets, it starts to get cold very quickly, and that ground becomes cold, soaked very readily, so to speak. Yeah, so anyway, I just gave you some pretty scary temperatures. Let's go back to that graphic. What do you think the significance of those albedo features are? Remember, I told you those are those are areas that are shiny. So, what do you what do you think's making them shiny? I'm going to let you guys tell me. I'm watching the chat. Ah, someone said it. That is ice. Very good. Not just any ice. Water ice. Now, this was a big deal a few years ago when this data was released. You see, it's difficult to study the composition of material in these deep craters because since they are in shadow, you don't have the convenience of sunlight filtering through them so that you can then study the spectra of the material. Um, we had to come up with more creative means of, of determining what was in there and using very sensitive infrared devices like those installed on the LRO, we can actually determine that it's more reflective than not in certain areas. These albedo features do tend to match the reflectivity profile of water. Now, that doesn't mean to say that it's liquid water. Um, this is essentially rock or moon dust that's impregnated with frozen water. Now, the um, the comp the actual uh, the density is surprisingly high. Uh, some of the the dust is estimated to have roughly about the same amount of water as you might find in one of these bottles in a cube, one meter. So, uh, a one meter cube of uh, Moon dust could have as much water as this bottle. That's actually a lot of water for a body that we used to think was completely desiccated. We thought there was nothing on the moon. We thought it was completely dry. One of the reasons we thought that was because when the Apollo astronauts landed there and took samples, the samples they brought back were extremely, extremely dry. But there's a reason for that. You see, 
the samples that those astronauts brought back were all taken in areas that are constantly subjected to sunlight. These sun-soaked areas experience that massive temperature swing I mentioned, I mean, literally hundreds of degrees shifting in one direction and another in the course of a single day. And when you have a temperatures that are that high and that volatile, then, vol then volatile compounds like water will, will phase transition to steam, or in this case, water vapor. We wouldn't call it steam on the moon. And that water vapor can be lost to solar wind. There is no wind in space, of course. Solar wind is the term we use for the constant barrage of high-energy particles from the sun. Also, static cling and static repulsion. Electrostatic repulsion can actually cause materials to leave the moon or stay up off the surface so they can be blown away by the sun. So yeah, that's why we, were thought, we thought the moon was quite dry. This was a big discovery, although this was not the really recent and really astonishing discovery. Um, last month, water was found using direct spectroscopic analysis from the famous SOFIA aircraft, not spacecraft. SOFIA is a flying infrared telescope. It flies at such an altitude that the infrared wavelengths we're interested in do penetrate deep enough to actually study. SOFIA discovered that there were actually traces of water in craters that were not at the poles. In other words, regions that do receive a lot of sunlight, yet there was still significant amounts of water in the dust. This is a big deal. Now, I could show you one of those craters. Check this out. All right, so this is a neat thing. This is a three-dimensional representation of the moon. Look at that. I'm spinning it around. And right now it's being, uh, it's actually right about like that. It's about how it looks from Earth. And as you can see, it's simulating the phase angle that we're in at this moment. Now, I'm going to zoom in here. And there's a crater here in shadow. This is Clavius Crater. And this crater Duh, is the one that was uh, discovered to contain water. Now, I'm going to turn off the phase. So we're going to have a full moon, so to speak. And I'm going to turn off those very confusing labels. And as you can see, Clavius is a good, good ways away from the south polar region here. See that? So this is a big deal. Now that it turns out there is a lot more water on the moon than we thought, it bodes well for uh, human space exploration. Because if we're serious about going back to the moon, and uh, building something there? Well, it'd be nice if we had a source of water, wouldn't it? Um, so yeah, that's a big deal. Clavius Crater is confirmed to contain water. Uh, not quite as uh, abundant as the uh, bottled water analogy I gave you, but it's still quite, quite a bit more than we expected from an object that used to be considered utterly, completely desiccated. Yeah. Well, let's center this. While I have this 3D representation of the moon on the screen, we might want to talk about a few things. I'm going to turn the phase back on. This will take a second. While we're waiting for that, go back to my image of... So there it is. So now we have the, the moon's phase being represented again. And I would like to talk about that a little bit. It's not off topic, but it's something that comes up. Believe it or not, phases are not something that really need to be discussed when it comes to the moon because they're not actually a lunar phenomenon, are they? Phases are not something that planets do or have or manifest because of something that's special about them. Phases are entirely a figment of our perspective. So because we are where we are at a given moment, because the object is where it is at a given moment, and because the light source is where it is at a given moment, it appears to have a certain percentage of illumination. But with a spacecraft, if you could fly around like in the science fiction movies, you could customize your phase angle. Check it out. So if I went over here... Look, it's a full moon. Even though people on the Earth see this. Ah. Yeah, so phase is really only determined by where you are, where the light source is, and where the object is. Look, I'm going over to the far side of the moon. Now we're on the other side. Now it looks like it's half again, but now it's reversed. Can you imagine that? It's all about where you are. I'm going to go back to this tool in a few minutes. This is a cool, cool three-dimensional simulator. Okay, so Sophia again there. This infrared airplane telescope, this aircraft telescope, has ended up making a lot of important discoveries in recent years. It's, it's uh, certainly a good value because aircraft are a lot less expensive than space telescopes, even giant ground-based telescopes. Okay, I'm going to ask more questions. I'm going to put that video back up just for funsies because we're supposed to be looking at the real moon, so here's a recording of it. All right, questions. Let's see. Mm -hmm. What is uh, 
Is the moon a satellite? Uh, what is the smallest moon in the solar system? That's very difficult to, to answer that question because some of the moons are absolutely tiny. Let me show you what I mean, and there are smaller ones than what you're about to see. So I'm going to zoom in here. Now, there's Earth's moon. And again, these are all drawn to scale. Look at Mars's two moons here, Phobos and Deimos. They're being blown up so you can see them, but they're actually quite puny, as you can see. Check that out. But there are moons smaller than that. Let's go over to Saturn. Itty bitty specks. Let's see here. Look at that. Polydeuces. What does it say for diameter? 3.7 kilometers. You could easily walk across that tiny little moon. Amazing. So we have Methone, another small one. I couldn't answer that question off the top of my head, what the smallest moon is. And in fact, I probably would get it wrong because we're still discovering moons in our solar system. That's why I said when I, when I said there's a, over 150 moons in our solar system, I have to be very careful to use that term over because we don't know exactly how many. We keep finding new ones. And part of the reason they can hide from us so well is because some of them are so absolutely puny. So yeah, uh, there are small moons and big moons and huge moons and some moons that even have Atmospheres. So Titan there, second biggest moon in our solar system. Notice the yellow haze. Notice the dark splotches. Titan is actually a moon with liquid surface features. It has lakes and oceans and rivers, except that it's so cold on Titan that they are not comprised of water, but rather methane. So liquid methane on Titan. A moon with a thick atmosphere and liquid bodies. Amazing. Something like straight out of science fiction, but it's real. It really exists. And we've already been there. Uh, the Huygens lander landed on Titan back in 2004, I believe, that time frame. And yeah, so we've, it's, the, it's actually the most distant body that we've ever landed on. Moons are of great interest to us, especially when they orbit gas giants. Jupiter and Saturn are not planets you could ever visit because they are enormous balls of hydrogen and helium. But they're orbited by these tiny worlds that are very much like a planet would be to us. This is why science fiction loves to make use of moons as a set piece and not just some random planet. Anyway. That's a good question. All right, let's see. So since someone asked about, the, is the moon a satellite? Last week I talked about artificial satellites, but moons are also satellites. They happen to be natural satellites. Yeah. What kind of things have been left behind on the moon? I mean, that's an embarrassing question because uh, it includes all kinds of awful things, like uh, the waste of the astronauts when they landed there. Everything got shoved overboard because they wanted to make as much room as they could for moon rocks. So all the various junk and other unpleasant things that ended up on the moon and it, there it remains to this day a lot of people don't realize that let me uh, show you a picture real quick that might impress you I, I recently talked about this the, uh, the Apollo program landed six different missions on the moon and we can now thanks to the same instrument we're talking about the LRO, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter we can actually see all of the landing sites let me show you So, let's start with Apollo 11. The famous Apollo 11. There's the landing module still there. By the way, this picture was taken like five or six years ago. Um, the footprints are still there from the astronauts. So not only did their stuff get left behind, but the traces of them as well. Imagine some future archaeologist going to the moon and being fascinated by these old boot prints that have remained unchanged. Probably for millennia, if we don't, if they don't, if they don't get disturbed by an impact from something, since there is no atmosphere on the moon, since there is no wind or rain or other erosive processes, things tend to stay there the way they were. So yeah, Apollo 11. Let's go now to Apollo 12. Now Apollo 12 was fun because they landed next to the Surveyor 3 spacecraft as a sort of a means of testing their ability to do a precision landing. They in fact did do it. They didn't think they would actually succeed, but they did, and then they walked over to it. Apollo 14, again, landing site. There actually are some wires here, a geophone line. They created a sort of large lunar seismograph using these wires that connected the different sensing modules. Oh, now look at Apollo 15. Notice that the, uh, the tracks are a lot more obvious. That's because... Those are not footprints. Those are tire tracks because that was the first mission where they landed this thing, the uh, LRV, the moon buggy, lunar reconnaissance vehicle. 
and they would include one of those on every mission after this. So here we have Apollo 16, there it is again, the rover, another Geo phone line, and then if I get my head out of the way, you will see the Apollo 17 LRV, the final parking spot, the last vehicle left on the moon with wheels. Once their batteries died, they just left them there and walked away, walked back to their ascent vehicle and left behind the bottom stage of it once they took off. Questions about all that? That was a good question. Well, that's good. Hold that. I'm going to, just so you guys know, I'm seeing a lot of good questions I will get to. I will, I promise. Now, um, notice something here called the LRRR. That is uh, one of my favorite gadgets on the moon. The the laser range finding retro reflector. This is one. This is the Apollo 11 LRRR. Notice it's a box of prisms. This is the Apollo 15 one. And in this case, you can actually get a good view of those prisms. So uh, hold that thought. I'm going to move down here. These are what they call corner cube prisms. These are the same exact kind of reflectors that we use in like traffic signage or uh, warning beacons. Uh, also, surveyists use them when they use their survey devices. They shoot lasers at these to figure out if they're lined up properly or not. These retro reflectors do exactly as their name suggests. They bounce light right back towards the source. We'll talk about why we do that in a second. This is directly related to this presentation. Here's another one. This is Apollo 14's LRRR. And what's neat about this picture is in addition to the LRRR, I also see some footprints. So just think about that, guys. Those footprints are still up there after all these years. I think that's delightful. Now, I told you this had uh, some bearing on our presentation. Does anyone here know why we put those retro reflectors on the moon? Hey, someone asked about the plastic bag. That's an example of garbage. So we, they would seal things in bags to prevent losing parts and also to make sure stuff kept together. You didn't want to make a mess when you're dealing with, you know, this tiny lifeboat that you're in. You don't want to let parts fly all over the place. They, so they used, they used um, plastic bags extensively. And when they were finished with their contents, out the door they would go because, again, they didn't want to bring back any trash with them. So I know it's not very romantic, but in addition to all our scientific gizmos and boot prints, there's also a lot of trash on the moon yes yes by the way not just human stuff um many robots have landed on the moon as well and they remain there yeah so i asked a question ah very good someone got it so to measure the distance we fire powerful lasers at the moon and the lasers bounce off of these retro reflectors coming back to earth it allows us to figure out with extreme precision the moon's distance and that's how we know the distance like i showed you in that Sure. It's also how we know the moon is leaving. We're losing the moon by about 1.5 inches per year. It gives you some idea of how incredibly precise our range finding capability is if we can determine something's leaving with that fine of a precision. We're talking about something 240,000 miles away, and we can determine with high accuracy that it's being flung away at 1.5 inches per year. That's also something we're going to talk about today. Hold that thought, because I wanted to see something else here. Someone mentioned... I want, to, I want to ask a simple question. I've actually been asked this a few times. Not so I don't see it in the chat, but it comes up a lot. Why is it that they didn't just use a mirror? Why did they use a box of prisms? Wouldn't a mirror have been cheaper? Of course, yes, it would have. And lighter. You know, weight savings is very important with space missions. So why didn't they just use a mirror? This is a topic I'd like to discuss. I'd like to see if you guys can tell me. Why do you think it is they used a box of prisms? and not a mirror just pointed at the earth. What do you think? Ah, because a mirror would reflect in a different direction, someone says, and not just straight back. True, but couldn't they aim it at earth so that it did bounce the laser straight back? And that's a deliberately stupid question. Why would that not work? What do you think? Why do you think that just pointing the mirror at the earth would not work? If you don't answer soon, I'll tell you. Oh, that's interesting. More, more prone to be totally ruined. No, no. 
This is this is a this is a tough. Ah, the moon moves. Yes, and not only does the moon move, as I mentioned earlier, everything is crooked. So because the moon and its orbital plane disagrees with both the orbital plane of the solar system and Earth's equatorial plane, sometimes the moon appears higher in the sky, and sometimes it appears lower in the sky. So right there, your aiming would be off, wouldn't it? But then there's something else, a subtle an effect known as libration. Check this out. So, this is the sky uh, over Goldendale. And before you get all excited that the clouds blew away, this is a simulation, of course. I'm going to pause time. I'm going to go back to now. Now, I'm going to go to the moon. I'm going to lock on here. Now, I'm going to speed up time. And I want you to watch what the moon does. You see the phase angle changing, of course, because as the moon moves around, oh, I just saw an eclipse there. As the moon moves around, the Earth, again, the perspective shifts. But there's something more subtle going on, you might notice. Let me speed it up more. Do you notice how the moon seems to be doing this and how it seems to also be doing this? It's kind of wiggling or shimmying a little bit. This phenomenon is known as libration. And this is very specific to the observer. You see, you go on a long trip every year. Or, every, excuse me, every day. As the Earth rotates, you, un, you start your day on one side of the Earth, and then you travel around until you're on the other side of the Earth. Now, you might not think that a, a few thousand miles of your travel on this spinning planet would make a difference. But when the moon is as close as it is, believe it or not, that does create a shift in perspective. So the moon seems to quiver because you're looking at it from over here, and you're looking at it from over here. And that's what happens all the time. Now, the software is simulating the view of the moon as though the Earth were transparent. So if you were to observe the Earth continuously, the if you were to observe the moon continuously, this is exactly what you would per perceive, this constant wiggling. And this is caused by multiple factors, the moon's crooked orbit, the fact that its orbit is not only inclined, but also eccentric, which means off-center. So its distance changes. That's why it's growing and shrinking. See that? And the wiggling caused by where you are on the planet. Believe it or not, the moon will shift ever so slightly in perspective. If you just go on a long road trip, if you were to drive several thousand miles south or north, the moon would go, or just a little bit. Because, again, it's so close. Normally, you would never be able to appreciably shift uh, perspective by going on a road trip when it comes to space bodies. But in the case of the moon, you could because it's just so extremely close to us. That is why a mirror would not work. The mirror would indeed, even if, even if the astronauts did a fantastic job installing it so that it pointed perfectly, exactingly at Earth, it immediately would stop doing that because of what we're talking about right here. That's an interesting topic. Keep that in mind. I'm going to start going back and looking at the uh, questions more. Wobbles, I like that. These are all good. Moving back and forth. So are the moon's poles shifting? No, well, the moon's uh, obliquity is quite mild, only one and a half degrees. So any wobble in that uh, in that alignment is extremely subtle as well. And the answer is yes, it is, but very slightly. Um, very, very, very slightly. Much less than the Earth's uh, wobble. Earth's axis actually precesses on a 26,000-year cycle. Because of that, we often have no North Star. Sometimes we have a different North Star. Yeah. There's no south star currently um, because Earth's axis does precess. And as I said, the moon does it well, but it's a, it's a much uh, more uh, subtle phenomenon. It's a good question. So. All right, I'm going to go back in the chat a bit. Oh, explain Earth's chain. That's a nice one. So I want to ask if there are volcanoes on the moon. That's, that actually uh, brings up a funny topic. So we used to think that all of the features, all of the features on the moon were volcanic in nature. So we thought that every single crater, and there are lots of them, was a volcanic crater. And so we thought that, wow, the moon is wildly volcanic. We, correct, we did correctly deduce that the maria, the dark splotches that someone asked about in the questions, is indeed ancient lava fields. But the moon is not geologically active, at least not at its surface. And those craters were not created by exploding volcanoes, but rather by impacts. Um, you could argue that there are volcanoes on the moon because 
some impact craters became the site of upwelling of magma. But that is not the primary uh, reason for the moon's mottled appearance. It's covered with craters. And no matter how close you get with your studies, look at them, there's just so many little itty bitty craters everywhere. Not volcanic. Let's see some interesting ones. I'll show you a famous crater here. I'm going to turn off the phase again. And here's one of my favorite craters. This is Tycho. Tycho is famous for its interesting central peak, which is not actually that rare with big craters, but also ejecta. You might notice that it has these rays coming out of it. Those rays are material that was ejected after the enormous explosion caused by the impact of whatever body that hit it. And here's another one. Look at these rays. Let's see what that is. That is Burgius A. Interesting. <laughs> and that crater, as you can see, has lots of ejecta around it as well. I bet there's a lot of questions about that. And feel free to keep asking follow-ups. Let me uh, put my head back on the screen really quick. Go back to my simulation here. I'm going to slow that down so you don't throw up. There you go. That's better. It's much more peaceful now. All right, let's see here. Uh, so those two things kind of answered each other there, the, the volcanoes and the maria. Starting to go. We talked a bit about temperature. Oh, yeah. That's, oh, someone, let me just follow up since I, I forgot to answer it. Um, as far as how you would get signals from a, let's say, a hypothetical radio telescope on the far side of the moon, well, you would do that with satellites. So we already do that. For example, China landed a, a, a probe and actually a, a lander on the far side, and they keep in touch using a satellite. So as the satellite goes overhead, it gets data from the probe, and then it sends it to Earth. So yeah, there's actually nothing stopping us from talking to the far side. It's just less convenient. We can't talk directly, but we can do it with relay satellites. The moon is actually orbited by several satellites, including the one we just talked about quite a bit today, the LRO, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. So yeah, uh, that's it is less safe. For example, if we wanted to put humans on the far side, we'd get pretty nervous about that because we want to keep in touch. And there is no way to talk to someone on the far side without a relay system of some sort. If humans ever do colonize the moon, if we ever actually do live there for, for a good amount of time, let's say decades, we could perhaps run cables along the a moon's surface. And that could be used not just for signals to transfer to the Earth side, but also perhaps power. For example, you could have uh, solar panels all around the moon, so it's always collecting electricity from the sun, no matter what the, the, the phase angle is. The lunar night is about 14 days long. That's a lot of darkness. And so it would be convenient if you can get sun from some other part of the moon. So yeah, that's not an impossible concept. And now I should add, now that we've discovered this water abundance, I think it's likely that humans will eventually do it, to go there and build some kind of long-lasting presence there. Let's see. So someone asked about Earthshine. Earthshine is not a uh, phenomenon caused by the moon. It's, as the name implies, a earthly phenomenon. So let me show you. So here we see, this is a real time lapse. I shot this down at the Mary Hill Stonehenge a few years ago. And uh, you can see that we have the brightly illuminated crescent of the moon. Now, of course, that crescent is being directly illuminated by the sun. But then we can see the rest of it, too. This is Earth shine, and we call it that because that is sunlight that is bouncing off of the big, shiny Earth and illuminating the dark portion. Yeah. So Earth shine is a beautiful phenomenon that occurs because of Earth having a high albedo, which means high re re reflectivity, thanks to our ice caps and clouds, for example. And imagine how dazzlingly bright the Earth must look from the moon. I envy the Apollo astronauts for getting to see our amazing planet from the moon. Consider that the Earth is four times bigger than the moon. So if you were on the moon's surface looking at the Earth, it would appear four times bigger than the moon does to us. So it would look huge and incredibly bright. Now, um, it should also be added that it won't set because the moon is tidally locked to the Earth. And so the same side always faces us. So if you were on the Earth side, you would always get to observe the beautiful Earth. Yes. Now on that subject, well, let me show you something. Can go back here. Watch this. We're gonna change. We're gonna change venues here. We're gonna go to the moon. Here we go. 
going to the moon. Let's go to, oh, that's funny, it has grass. Just so you know, there's no grass on the moon. The software doesn't know any better, so I'm going to turn that off. There you go. Let's find the Earth. Now, I'm going to speed up time. Now, the green line is the horizon. See the green line, the horizon? Notice that the Earth is not setting, but it does make a little loop. See that? See the little loop-de-loop -loop that it makes? Let's zoom in here a bit. What a thing to see. Just imagine. Just imagine being on the moon and seeing this. Let's slow it down a little bit. And the reason it does that little loop-de-loop -loop like we talked about, let me speed it up again so you can see it, is because of all those crooked angles we talked about earlier. Interesting. Okay, now, we're starting to get into some important stuff. I mentioned the fact that the moon is tidally locked. This is a big deal. Let me put up a video that kind of helps explain this a little bit. Tidal locking is not actually a rare phenomenon. The solar system is full of tidally locked bodies. So, even though the Earth spins in 24 hours, the moon rotates at the same rate as its, its month, so to speak, its cycle, which is a little bit less than 30 days. And because of that synchronization, we always see the same side facing us. The same is not true on the moon, of course, of the Earth, because the moon is not tidally, excuse me, the moon is tidally locked to the Earth, but the Earth is not tidally locked to the moon. We are not doubly locked. This is single locking. Many space bodies are tidally locked. The Jupiter's moon Io, for example, is tidally locked to Jupiter. We know of entire star systems now where all the planets are tidally locked to their parent star. Imagine that. You'd have a permanent day side and a permanent night side. In the case of tidally locked moon and planetary bodies, you have a permanent planet side and a permanent no planet side. There is a set of bodies in our solar system that are doubly locked, and it's a very famous body. It's the pluto charon system. So I'm going to pause this. This is Pluto. This is Charon. These are some of the other moons. This is real footage that's been heavily enhanced. This is from the, the, the New Horizons probe, which visited Pluto in 2015. And notice how the two dance around each other. Look. You see how they have a dumbbell orbit? And here we are, the close-up of Pluto, our amazing rendezvous. Here it is backlit from the sun, so you can see its atmosphere of nitrogen. Let's watch that again. This, this dance between Pluto and Charon. Tidal locking happens when two bodies are able to pull on each other's surfaces for a long period of time. Essentially, it slows the surface of one body, speeds up the surface of another, and the winner is obviously determined by who's the more massive. But if the mass is similar enough between the bodies, eventually they both become locked, as Pluto and Charon have. In the case of the Earth-Moon system, like I said, the Moon is locked to Earth, but Earth is not locked to the Moon. However, the Moon continues to tug on Earth's surface as well. We all know this is... This is why tides happen, the moon's gravity pulling on our surface. Well, those tides actually represent a transfer of energy. There's actually a tug of war going on, and slowly, slowly, and surely, the moon slows down the rotation of our planet. Now, let me show you something kind of cool about this. We're going to, go, we're going to talk about paleontology. So, this is a, um, a fossil shell of a mollusk. 70 million years old, and yet even with such age, we can determine the age of the mollusk by counting the little rings that you see very much like a tree. And we can determine the length of day that this mollusk, mollusk experienced by very slight chemical variations in these layers that you see. Now, those chemical variations are caused by bacteria that lived on the surface of the mollusk and would create sugar when the sun was out and would not when it wasn't. And so, believe it or not, we can actually figure out how long the day was for this creature that lived and died 70 million years ago, this extinct species. And what we discover is, 70 million years ago, the day was only 23 and a half hours long, so a bit shorter than our day because Earth spun a bit faster because 70 million years ago, the sun, the moon rather, had not managed to slow us down quite as much. 
This process has been ongoing for billions of years, the moon slowing Earth's rotation. That's a big deal. We're going to get to that near the end of the show. That might be worth one worth asking questions about. I'm going to keep that on the screen. Any questions about that? Yes. Okay, now, we're getting down to the fun part. Someone asked an interesting question, several questions on here about the shape of the moon. Understand that the moon is absolutely not a perfect sphere. Watch this. This is a highly exaggerated gravitational anomaly map of Earth's moon. And what you see, let me slow that background down. There you go. <laughs> That's a little better. Well, it's not much better. Notice that the moon, and again, this is exaggerated, is very much teardrop shaped. There seems to be a mass asymmetry. And the asymmetry seems to be biased towards the Earth side. See this? This is evidence that the moon formed very close to our planet. And tidal interactions between the two bodies would have led to this distribution of mass. This is a big deal because it starts to help us solve the mystery of the moon's formation. We start, we start now to have enough information that we might be able to start addressing it. So, in a nutshell, the moon would have had to have formed perilously close to the Earth to achieve the mass distribution that we see. We have discovered that the lunar far side is much thicker in crust than the lunar near side. Let me go back to my uh, simulation here. So notice that the lunar Earth side is covered with maria. That's the ancient lava flow we talked about because the crust is thin there. So when impacts occur, it's more likely that magma, molten rock, will find its way to the surface. Oh, by the way, here's a lunar gravitational anomaly chart. And notice that there are gravity anomalies that correspond with the maria. This is consistent with what we see on Earth as well. When we look at ancient volcanic lava fields, we see a very dense packing material, and so we see this, in this case, these hotspots. This is the side of the moon that faces us. This is the side that faces away from us. Check this out. We can study the elemental content of the moon material. This is from the Clementine spacecraft. And this is a chart demonstrating iron enhancement. And as you can see, there has been an enhancement of iron in the maria because, again, the lava has dredged up iron-rich material from within. Most of the heavy elements inside of the moon, the same with any big space body, are deep inside because as the body forms, those elements sink. But they can be dredged up by volcanism. So as we can see, a lot of dredging has occurred, a lot of iron enhancement on the Earth side, but very little on the far side except for this interesting patch. That patch corresponds to a gravity anomaly. There seems to be an iron enhancement right over this unusual heavy spot on the moon's surface. And some of you may have heard this has recently been discovered to be an enormous, and I do mean enormous, impact basin. And there seems to be an extreme concentration of heavy metals deep beneath the surface, hundreds of miles beneath. Apparently, the moon got whacked with a very large, iron-rich asteroid early in its existence. And there it remains, part of the moon's mass. But it has essentially dented the moon as a result. And so someone asked me about the roundness of it. It's, it's very much not round, and this is an example of why. It gets clobbered with heavy objects. And again, I want to repeat, the backside is thicker than the Earth side. Let me go back to my uh, live moon view here, or my, my uh, live simulation, I should say. I don't want to be dishonest. And uh, lots of Maria on this side, and here's the far side. As you can see, very little Maria. This is also evidence that the moon formed extremely close to the Earth. So, some of you may have heard the famous story. In a nutshell, the problem with the moon is its orbit is too similar to the plane of the solar system to be explained. Its orbit is too different from the plane of our planet, or especially our equatorial plane, to be explained. Its isotopic similarities to Earth are too, too compelling to ignore but they're not exact enough to make an open and shut case. And then we discover this mass asymmetry. We find that the, 
the moon's mass is heavy, weighted towards us. And we learn that by comparing data, for, for example, paleontological data like that mollusk, mollusk shell, we discover that, oh yeah, the moon is indeed actively slowing our rotation. And that particular example with the mollusk, that 70 million year distant time frame, does agree with the projected values for a moon that formed very close to the Earth. So we actually think that a very large body struck the Earth in its early years and annihilated our planet. And it didn't break off a chunk, as you may have heard in school. Our Earth was destroyed and reformed as a double planet, the Earth-Moon system. Now, the impactor would have been Mars-sized, if this is true. And as a result, it would have definitely been moving along the ecliptic plane, the primary plane of our solar system. And it helps to explain a lot of strange things. So, check out this exciting video, my friends. Oh, no. This is Thea coming in. Oh, dear. Oh, what a catastrophe. Thea, the name for this hypothetical object, has just pulverized our planet. And an enormous disk of material has been blasted out, not just by the inertia of the impact, but also the explosive energy of the impact and the tremendous heat of the impact. Essentially, Earth is now a molten blob again. Notice the, uh, the accretion disk is complicated. Notice how it's got clumps in it. This, is, this uh, animation you're watching is based on a supercomputer simulation. And we, determined, we discovered that by running these simulations, this is a much more... Uh, dynamic process than we expected. It doesn't make a nice, neat, tidy little disk that just coalesces quickly. So yeah, Earth formed as a planet. Good, good chance it was struck by a Mars-sized object, destroyed utterly, and we get the Earth-Moon system as a result. This does help address many of the mysteries. The fact that the isotopic similarities are not exact, but they're too close to ignore. The fact that the moon is asymmetrical in its mass distribution. The fact that we know it would have had to have formed very close to do what it does now. The, uh, the fact that its orbit is in greater agreement with the ecliptic plane of our solar system than the equatorial plane of our planet. All of these things add up. This is still a hypothesis. We have not proven it, but I think it's a really good hypothesis and it helps, again, address the mystery. Oh, and I forgot one of the simple things. The fact that the Earth-facing side is so thin and covered with uh, ancient lava fields on the backside. Now, again, consistent with the, the moon forming around our Earth very close. And by the way, the fact that the moon is leaving is an example of Earth slingshotting it away. While the moon may pull on our surface, slowing down our rotation over eons of time, that same interaction, that same relationship, causes the Earth to endow excess energy onto the moon, causing it to accelerate and slowly leave. That's why we're literally ejecting the moon. Look at that. We should watch that exciting animation again. There it is. I've covered most of what I hope to cover tonight. And uh, I would like to begin wrapping it up by answering questions. We've already had some really good ones. Let's see. <laughs> does the moon have a magnetic field? Yes. Um, the magnetic field of the moon is quite weak, but it does have one. Uh, it's also quite sporadic and random, too. It's, it's splotchy. It's not uniform. Uh, we know that the moon's core is almost certainly not active in the way ours would be. There is probably still molten iron inside of the moon's core, but it's certainly not active enough to create the geodynamo that we experience here on Earth and other, other planets that have active cores. So yeah, the moon does have a magnetic field. Much of it's residual from a time when it probably did have an actually active dynamo mechanism at some point. I'm going to put my head back on the screen while I talk. Hi there. So let's see. I'm going to start quickly answering questions. You know, we did fill the hour. I didn't expect that. I don't know why. I thought we'd go short because of the lack of video time. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Did the geo did, did the geo phones measure any seismic activity? Oh, but you bet they did. One of the cool things the Apollo program did was deliberately slam the Apollo booster rockets into the surface, going about twenty thousand miles per hour. And they discovered with the geo phones that the moon would ring like a bell, which indicated that it had deep hollows beneath. That there were uh, there's apparently some voids beneath the surface that allows the moon to resonate like that. By the way, that's not a random tangent. If we do move to the moon, if we do live there one day, there's an interest in using ancient lava tubes. This is very interesting. Because the moon's gravity is weak, it can form lava tubes much larger than those you might see in Hawaii on Earth, for example. And these lava tubes, believe it or not, 
can be miles tall. So if any of you have ever seen a lava tube in Hawaii, I mean, you could crawl through it and you might have to duck occasionally. Imagine a lava tube that was miles tall. Sometimes they've actually collapsed and we can see into them. That's how we discovered their existence. So perhaps you could live, maybe you could build a city inside of one of these lava tubes, protected partially from cosmic radiation by the moon dust. A lot of people don't realize that if we do live on the moon, it's, it's because of the intense cosmic radiation, it's very unsafe. And so what we have to do is bury our habitats. When we build any structures on the moon, we'll have to bury them in moon dust to provide radiation shielding. That's a good question. Mm hmm. I'm not going to talk too much about the Apollo program, guys. I know there's a lot of questions about it, but I want to talk more about the science of the moon itself. Apollo comes up a lot. We actually, I'm going to do whole shows about the Apollo program for the different anniversaries as they come up. Speaking of which, we had a wonderful one with, with the 50th uh, two years ago. That was a great time. If I were standing on the moon, would the Earth appear to do this? Yes, so it, would, it, make, it makes that little loopy shape that I showed you. What software program are you using to educate us on the moon? Uh, the one that I use a lot here is called Stellarium. Uh, Stellarium, Stellarium, and it is free. It's also open for source, and I've modified it quite a bit because it is open source. It allows you to tweak it as you will, mo modify it as you need. The other one is that Moon program, which is, which has a, a name that's not the virtual, the virtual Moon Atlas. How, uh, how catchy! The virtual Moon Atlas. That's the one I was using for that three-dimensional globe you saw. Okay. Um, Maria are lava. The moon does have an iron core. Have we seen crater history on the moon that if they had hit the Earth instead they caused an extinction type of event? Oh, yeah. So the moon is pulverized, as you know, covered with craters, and many of them would have been large enough events to cause extinctions. However, I need to, I need to dispel an old myth. Maybe some of you have heard that the moon protects us. No. Earth is a much bigger and heavier target. We get hit more often than the moon does. Uh, the reason Earth is not covered with craters is because Earth has an atmosphere. So most objects that hit Earth burn up in the atmosphere. And then on the rare occasion something does clobber the Earth and leave a big scar, those scars are erased by erosion. Rain, wind, plate tectonics, continental drift. Earth actually has identif uh, identifiably uh, many dozens and dozens of craters, but most of them are well hidden because of erosion, which erases them. The best, the best crater in the, in the world that you can visit is the uh, very cleverly named Meteor Crater in Arizona, also known as Behringer Crater. And Me Meteor Crater is very young. It's only about 50,000 years old, and so it hasn't had time to be erased yet. It also helps that it's in the desert. So you can go down there and look at this crater as very much like it appeared 50,000 years ago. It just hasn't changed much yet. But then there are craters that are literally billions of years old, and we can only find them via gravity mapping. Just kind of like, kind of like that gravity map image I showed you. We know that there's some impactor here, not just because of the iron enrichment, but because of the, the gravity anomaly. We can actually discover impact events, not just by finding the rock or whatever, but by finding this disturbance in the, the density gradient of the surface material and beneath. Yeah, that's a good question. If the, so that's an, someone asked, if the moon formed by accretion, then why is it lumpy and irregular? Well, actually, most bodies in the solar system are lumpy and irregular. It's actually unusual to find something that's round. A better question is, why is the moon so round? And that's because it is so heavy. As moons go, the moon is a relatively heavy object. But don't forget, there are literally trillions of comets and asteroids which are not round at all. They're quite strangely shaped because they don't have enough mass to <coughs> crush themselves into a ball. Yes, good question. The moon does control, move the tides, yes. Does that mean the moon will eventually crash into the Earth? No, the opposite. We're losing the moon. We're throwing the moon away about one and a half inches a year. Uh, but if it makes you feel any better, the sun will die long before we lose the moon. So there you go. And if you're worried about the sun dying, you really shouldn't, because that won't happen for about 5 billion years or 5,000 million years. So yeah, you have nothing to worry about in either sense. You're not going to lose the moon, and we're not going to... We're not going to lose the sun either anytime soon, so please don't worry about such things. I know the internet is full of doomsday narratives. I know everyone wants to talk about the end of everything, but uh, the heavy bombardment period is mostly over. The reason the moon is covered with craters and the reason that many of them are similar in age is because there was a time in our solar system's ancient history where it was a much more violent place. All you have to do is look at the surface of Mercury, 
This is the planet Mercury. This is not the moon. Poor Mercury. Look at all those craters. Most of them sustained during the heavy bombardment period. Mercury carries these scars today because Mercury, like Earth's moon, lacks a thick atmosphere to intercept bodies and lacks erosive properties that would erase these impacts. Yeah, good question. Mm -hmm. Question. Oh, thanks. Thanks for the congratulations on our, our much-deserved architectural award. Yes, I'm not going to talk about that too much. But yes, that is pretty cool. I'm very excited about that. All right, so we went over time about eight minutes. I'm going to I'm gonna give you, let's do, let's stop at 8.15. So we'll have seven more minutes. Let's see what we got. I'm looking at the, ta the chat. Uh, Someone is very kindly helping me moderate the chat, and I'm seeing they're ticking off all the things I got. Let's see. Mm -hmm. A lot of good questions tonight. I'm happy about that. All right, so let's start wrapping it up. Let's ask some questions or make some comments or maybe some hilarious jokes. Please don't do that. But hey, you can. I'm sure I can't stop you. So uh, I'm looking at the uh, chat myself. Mm -hmm. Temporary cat. Oh, that's cool. That's a cool topic. Yeah, so er, uh, someone asked about the fact that we occasionally have more than one moon. Uh, there are bodies in our solar system that that occasionally orbit the Earth, and they have very strange orbits. I actually do have an image of that if I can find it really quick. Let me see. I do. I found it. So what is this object? Oops. Let's see. 2020 CD3. It's 11 feet wide, an object that's 11 feet wide. It goes from a million miles from Earth to as close as 8,000 miles. Here is a picture of its wild and crazy orbit. Look at that. So... Believe it or not, that qualifies as a moon, a temporary moon, but a moon nonetheless. The white rings you see are the Earth-Moon system, our typical moon, and the red line is the orbit of this object known as 2020 CD3. So this would be a temporary moon that occasionally wanders on by, orbits our planet for a while, and then goes along its merry way, only to be recaptured decades later. Yeah, it turns out that uh, the environment around the Earth is busier than we thought. And because, moon, because the Earth is a relatively heavy planet, we do collect things like this. This is an example of capturing bodies. But, again, we couldn't have captured the moon. It was far too massive for that to have occurred. That's a great question. I like that question. All right, so. More questions. How often are you holding this live stream for education? We are trying to do this once a week, uh, every Sunday at 7 o'clock. This is something we had always planned to do anyway, but it kind of works out with the whole closure for the virus. So uh, this is the best we can do for you right now. Uh, so once a week at 7. These YouTube videos are not erased upon completion of the broadcast, so uh, if you want to watch it later, you can. I uh, discovered that the chat log reappears about 12 hours later, uh, so if you want to read the chat, too, it, it won't always be up immediately afterwards. But as far as the actual presentation, yeah, this this is will be on our Washington State Parks YouTube live channel under the the playlist known as Golden Dale Observations. Yeah. Thanks for asking. So someone keeps asking about the moon rusting. The reason it rusts is because it does contain quite a bit of oxide, oxide molecules, uh, and there's plenty of oxygen to go around. A lot of people don't realize that oxygen is the third most abundant in the entire, the third most abundant element in the entire universe. Most of the the rocks on the surface of the moon are silicate based, but there's also oxides and uh, m molecules that have both oxygen and silicon. And uh, so the moon rusts because it also has a lot of iron. Let me go back to that iron enhancement picture I showed you. So, oh, you know what? I didn't show you one of the cool videos. So hold that thought. So the uh, the iron enrichment. Look at the numbers here. So in these red spots you see in the Maria, look at this, 14% by weight. So that means that if you were to take any of these moon rocks from this area, that 14% of their weight would be just iron. That's a lot of iron. And so, yeah, that, that's what causes the moon to rust. If that, if they, I hope that answers your question. You have a lot of oxygen, a lot of solar radiation in the form of ultraviolet light, especially, which energizes chemical reactions. And then you have the iron. Yeah. And that's what iron is, isn't it? 
By the way, guys, that's what gives a famous planet his famous color. Who am I talking about? Mars, the red planet, is known as the red planet because of an abundance of iron oxide on his surface, also known as rust. Rusty, dusty. Yeah. Good question. So I didn't tell you about the central ridges. I showed you an uh, image earlier of the uh, various craters on the moon, and I showed you that Tycho is famous for having a central peak. It's not the only one that does have one, but you can easily see this central peak in a telescope. But those of you who don't know why this happens, it's actually a very relatable process. Check it out. This is the, the milk drop experiment. So that, that drop of milk just hit, hit the bowl of milk and it made a little splash. But nothing else interesting happened. Now here comes a big drop of milk, watch. Boosh. Now, what happens is the material rushes back and we get that splash in the middle. Well, in the case of molten rock, it is much more uh, readily able to phase transition back into a solid. Rock wants to be frozen very easily, of course. And so what happens essentially is as the molten rock rushes back into the void created by the explosion from the impact, it will pile up in the middle like that, but then suddenly it will freeze because it cools down enough for it to transition back to a solid. That's a little extreme. They don't tend to look like spires like that. But I do want to show you something. I'm going to pause it. Notice how you have this, this break here. We might have a real example of this in Tycho Crater. Watch this. Tycho Crater is very impressive. And the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter is very impressive. This was taken with the LRO as well. Now watch this. I can Watch the, the resolution of this picture. This is incredible. I'm going to zoom in. This is the central peak in the center of Tycho. You notice something in the middle there? This boulder, this boulder is 300 feet across. And there's a mystery as to how it got there. One, I, one suggestion is it might actually be a, a blob of material that broke off from the central peak and then solidified and crashed back down to the center of the of the central rise. It's an interesting thought. So, yeah, check it out. If you're wondering how the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter can take such incredibly high-resolution images of the moon's surface, like, for example, you can see footprints of astronauts, it's because it's very low. It only orbits the moon about 12 miles above the surface, like I said. And also, there's no atmosphere to trouble us. When it comes to atmosphere on Earth, that makes it very hard to see through the air. It makes it hard to study things in detail. There's no such problem on the moon, so the only limitation is the quality of your instruments, the technology you're using. You're not being affected by atmosphere, because there is none. Imagine that. There is technically some air on the moon, but it's so thin it's not even worth talking about. Uh, for, for example, um, on Earth's surface at sea level, you might have about 100 billion molecules in a, in a cubic centimeter. On the moon, it's 100 molecules. Not 100 billion, 100. That means that Earth's atmosphere at sea level is one billion times more dense than what you want to call air on the moon. The moon is effectively a vacuum. It does have a little bit of atmosphere, but not one that's really worth talking about. All right, I said 8.15. It's now 8.16, so I am going to start saying goodbye. I hope you guys have had fun tonight. I hope, hope we learned a few things. Oh, any oh yeah, this is a good way to end the show. Any objects to look for in the sky? Uh, well... Right now you have a beautiful show after sunset. You get Jupiter and Saturn moving into the southwest. You have Mars in the east high up. You'll see the moon amongst them. And uh, it's important to note that Jupiter and Saturn are moving quickly towards what we call a great conjunction. And actually in the end of December, they're going to be so close to each other in the sky that you could fit them both into the eyepiece of a telescope of reasonable power. So that's a big deal. That only happens about every two decades. So yeah, a great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn is not to be missed. The good news is it's a slow motion event. You don't have to go out in exactly the right millisecond to see it. If you go out anytime, well, for example, now you'll see it. As they get closer, you'll still appreciate their proximity. They won't be this close, but they'll be that close. That's still pretty impressive. Yeah, so um, that's a good one, uh, the great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. And by the way, you can't miss them. Jupiter is the brightest object out besides uh, the moon. You won't see Venus right now. She's not up until the early morning. So Jupiter is the brightest evening object by, by far, Not again, including the moon. So look for the bright Jupiter, and then to his left, you'll see Saturn. Yeah. Well, this went better than expected, given the weather. I hope, again, that we had a good time. Uh, because we are now on uh, Facebook, not Facebook, because we are now on YouTube Live, 
we do appreciate it if you would like and subscribe our videos. We're trying to grow the, uh, the agency YouTube channel. This is kind of a new thing for us. And I, I will tell you, I'm really happy with it. I love the quality of the video and I love the low latency. So we would love to keep using this platform and your support will help us do that. So like and subscribe. Yeah. Well, my friends, this has been fun for me. I am going to wish you all a good evening. And please stay curious, keep asking questions, and please tune in next week. Have a good night.